Sean, uh, uh, there's no money writing on this, but Jason and I have a friendly bet. Uh, I, you know, my love for you is unconditional and you're the hardest working guy in show business. And I tell you that all the time. I follow you on Twitter as many of our listeners do. And uh, I see a lot of your schedule. In fact, I think last night, check this out, Jason, this Sean does something that I would just terrify me. Uh, every, what is it? Every month, Sean, he does a round table. Oh, every week. Every week he does a round table and he takes, how many did you have last night? What was it? Uh, six? Uh, seven? There, was, there, was, there was seven or eight of us, but one couldn't make it last minute because his wife teaches school and had an issue at school. But it's between eight and 10 every week. And I pay and take them and treat them to dinner and all the drinks they want. And I, I've had people want to sponsor it, but I said, this is on me just to show my appreciation. And we sit around, talk sports, life, tell fun stories. And it's supposed to be 90 minutes. And we got done. We started at six every week and got done about nine thirty last night. <laughs> The, Sean truly loves his job and truly loves his life, and a lot of that's from a guy who's been high and low mm-hmm. and high and worked his worked his ass off to get back to where he is now and still going strong. My thing was this, Sean. Other than your radio show, which ended five minutes ago, and it was a four-hour radio show in Houston, how yep. many radio show guest spots have you done since, uh, assuming you didn't do any over the weekend, which could be wrong, since Monday? Yeah, I probably do, in the off-season, Dave, probably 20 a week, 15 a week. I I put the over-under at 7.5, and and my God, that was low. But during the season, Uh it'll be, there's times, it's get to the point now, like in Arizona, I'm doing for two different stations on two different days. San Francisco, two different stations. In Arizona, I take that back, I'm doing two different stations on the same day. (laughs) So San Francisco, so it... It depends, you know, whether it's Memphis, it's D.C., it's Miami, it's it's uh, two in California, it's, uh, you know, it, they're the Arizona, too. They're all over. So I probably average during the football season uh, 20 to 30 a week, I guess. Wow. And some summer, summer weekly and scheduled um, all the time, summer now. But I, when it's not, but the scheduled ones, they're uh, high double digits in the 20s probably in the the ones that people will call in. They, they, there's times during the football season where I'm doing six, seven a day That's outside insane. of my show. Do you have a headset? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Something, dude. Absolutely. <laughs> Why did I take the under? Right. I was way off. I know. I put it at seven and a half, and I was like, I think. If, if you just said seven in a day, you'd have won. <laughs> <laughs> you know. My goodness. Sean, we were speculating all the things you played and all the times. You ever played on a modified field like the Raiders, an 80 yard field yesterday? Um, I, I have not. Defend the, your country. The, you're, a, you're a Canadian, technically. Yeah, yeah. Come on. I, I played on the – here's the irony. <laughs> it was the field's longer in, in Canada. Right. And, you know, we shortened it for them. So, no, I've never – I played on a wider one and a longer one. I've never I never played in the Arena League. So, I've never played on a shorter, smaller field or a, an adjusted one during the – during the uh, the game or the season, that's a first. Now, I played half court basketball, like we all have, <laughs> but I have never ever played football on the field. But I I don't know, you know, if you're not going to play your starters, if that's the reason that the Packers decided to not play their starters. I mean, I don't know what that has to do with anything, but I guess they didn't like the field. I wouldn't play my superstars anyway in the preseason period, but uh, I've never played on an abbreviated field. Well, and you know, Jason, uh, we're talking to Grey Cup champion. That's right, Sean Salisbury. His his, and by the way, his Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Mm. Twenty. Yeah, don't hate the peg. No, Do not hate the peg. Can't twenty two twenty one behind head coach Mike Riley. Is this oh. right, Sean? You won the Grey Cup, and, and you guys were nine and nine, and BC was ten and eight. That's pretty sick. Yeah. Well, I, here's what happened. I was in a tra- train camp. And I got there late. I was I didn't make it for training camp. I was there were a couple games into the season, a game or two into the season, or just starting. You know, I didn't start the first two games because I was learning their system. And then and we're, it was either game three or game four. And I can't remember which one. I all of a sudden, Tom Mickey, God rest his soul, former team who passed away in, in the last couple of years. He went to Baylor and he's from here and was a special, unique guy. He was out in warm up and he blew out his bursa sack in his That's- elbow. Uh, so we come in to the to the it, it, before the game after pregame warm up. He's laying on the table and he's getting IV and the rest of it. His face is flushed. And Mike Riley comes up and says, "Sean, you're going to have to start." I said, "Well, I, I, I not have to. I get to." And I felt bad for Tom, but if I had Tom on my mind when I went out and played, I never gave the job back. So we went on a run. We threw for four thousand yards, and I got to call my own plays the majority of the season. And we went on. 
to win the Grey Cup because we were chasing it the whole time to get into the playoffs. Then we went in. We went on the road to Toronto, beat them in rain, came home to Winnipeg, beat Hamilton in snow. Uh, and then we went to the Grey Cup uh, championship in Ottawa, uh-huh. and it was like unseasonably warm, 55 degrees, but windy about 40 miles an hour. So we got to see all three different kinds of weather in the preseason. Um, but won it, and it was pretty awesome. Because, you know, at that time of year, I, I was there, and you, we practiced outdoors. And you, we didn't have an indoor facility, so we practiced in minus 20, minus 30, uh. 10 days in a row. We never practiced once indoors. So I, I learned how to be a pretty good bad-weather quarterback because of that. Didn't wear gloves, and we had some tough dudes on our team. So we grinded it out, and, and just once you get in the tournament, everything's up, and we were able to capitalize and play big in big games. He's being humble, by the way. He left out the 35-yard strike to James Murphy to take the lead. Sorry. couple. A huh, yep. couple field goals after that in front of 50,604. Nice. By the way, all this from memory by me. I'm, not, I'm totally not looking at the box <laughs> score right now. Sean, uh, congratulations, by the way, on that. And then also. Thank uh, you. <laughs> You're only 40 years late to the party. But three years. Never too late. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tell us about, tell us what you see about Jimmy Garoppolo. I saw you commenting on this on, on some other shows, and uh, I, I, yep. want, I want some of that. What do you see here? Should Niner fans maybe not be panicked, but should they be concerned? Sure, of course we are, but I, I, I caution the knee jerk. I mean, you know, the, the, we we do we do it. I, it's still preseason, uh, so all of a sudden now, look what we're doing in New York. Those same people in New York that despised Daniel Jones now poll questions are coming out. Should he start the opener? So is that not a knee jerk? Because it's preseason. Believe, believe me, I had the best preseason game of my preseason of my career, my rookie year, and I needed to to make a team. We had six quarterbacks on the roster in Seattle. So for those guys, it's important, but. I wasn't ready to go start over David Craig because of my preseason, okay? I mean, let's, let's keep this in perspective and understand it's vanilla coverages, but I love Daniel Jones. I had him as the second quarterback being drafted anyway, and people laughed at him. It's not his fault the Giants took him. Now he's capitalizing. So in this case, see, I'm not worried about Jim. Think about this, guys. I've shredded my knee twice. You know what you're thinking about, Jimmy's going through, is to get back on the field. So what are you doing the entire year? You're grinding on rehab. You're not even thinking about your football mechanics. You're not thinking about throwing dig routes or, or go routes. You're trying to get healthy. And then when you finally get healthy, then the mental part kicks in. Can I put my leg in the ground and drive through the throw in, when, real, when real players are flying around and we put the gear on? So you're going through that side. And I'm not making excuses for him. The mechanics I've seen from Garoppolo since he's been in the league tell me that I'll take what he's done in the regular season and say, I, I judge that more than the preseason he's struggling through, you know, one of six and then five picks in a row in practice, which I've never seen, but it's still practice. It's still the preseason. But I think for me that the concern is not panic, but that Jimmy doesn't get caught into believing what he's hearing right now. Don't listen to us. Don't, don't be reading papers because then you can get into the mental and physical yips. I mean, mental and emotional yips, not physical. He's physically going to be fine as long as his knee's fine. It's the key like when a putter, these pro golfers, you think when Johnny Miller back in the day when he was as good a golfer as we had in the world but couldn't make a four-foot putt at the end of his career when he was man alive, I got the yips, he could make 99 out of 100 four-foot putts with his eyes closed. That was mental, and that was emotional. And Jimmy's got a guard. That's my concern. Will he let this if he doesn't have a great preseason game and uh, before the season starts, if he's, if he's struggling all the way through preseason, will he let the mental and emotional yips of a radio station or a TV show or a hot take national TV show rip at him saying, oh, see, Garoppolo's not worth the money. Slow it. Relax a little bit. Now, you talk to me in October and he's playing like this, then, then, then we've got uh, cause for alarm. Is it mental, physical, or anything else? So I'm not panicked yet. I do believe you're going to see a far better Jimmy Garoppolo in the regular season than you saw He was six stupid throws. We overdo practice throws and the rest of it. All that crap happens. But the mental and emotional side for Garoppolo, got to guard against those yips. I think he'll physically be fine. And I think in the long run, uh, it'll it'll still prove to be the right thing for the 49ers that Jimmy Garoppolo is not only a player, but a really, really good one. Now, Sean, Dave, and I always try to you know talk about these quarterbacks and where do we place them amongst the league. There's 32 starters. You played the position. You see this differently than we do. Where would you put amongst the 32 starters guys like Jimmy Garoppolo and out here Derek Carr as well? Where do you rank those two guys? You know, I was talking on my show about two days ago about guys under pressure this year. The quarterbacks under pressure, and they're always under pressure. But you think Kirk Cousins, right? All that money and they didn't make the playoffs. Cam Newton, and now with the injury, why you shouldn't be playing your stars in the preseason. Let that be an example. that You don't play Aaron Rodgers or Deshaun Watson. Don't play him. Now, both Carr and Garoppolo 
seem to need a little bit of this to get them going, and John Gruden wants to see some of it. But you know what? Right now, neither one are in the top ten. I think if, I think heading into before the Garoppolo was hurt, I think most of us would have taken Jimmy over Derek. And then two years ago, you know, Derek Carr when he was having the MVP season, or was it heck now three years, or whatever that playoff was when Connor Cook started, that he was having a great year, and that injury and coaching change seemed to set his game back a little. Both of them must have. They, they, they have to have comeback seasons. They just do. John falls in and out of love with quarterbacks. Uh, Jimmy, the, the, the history at San Francisco with Montana and Young, and they think that this is the next guy, and the, both teams expect to be better than they were last year. Um, you know, Winston and Mariota have pressure. I think Carson Wentz to prove he can say, oh, there's a lot of them. But right now, I don't think you can put either one in the top 15 quarterbacks. Mm-hmm. You, just, just on body of work and recent injuries, I think there's a little bit of lack in confidence. Now, if you ask me of watching and knowing the position, I think both are better. Carr's got to prove to me, and I talked to a couple guys really close to this situation that said, keep an eye on him in December games on the road like Kansas City and see if you see something different. And when he gets hit early in games, see how he overcomes it, which, with which the, the talk was uh, that that's the knock on him. Can he overcome that stuff? So you guys keep an eye on that, and I'm watching it closely from somebody who knows. And then secondly, when it comes to Jimmy Garoppolo, just getting the confidence back, because I know physically he's got the skills. Both of these guys should be top 12, top 14 guys. But right now, you go through, you're not getting to the 10. And then we're talking out of the 10 is like the the Mayfields, the Darnolds, the Prescotts, um, those type of players. And you look around and say, well, are, are Jimmy and Derek better than them? Uh, on paper right now it says no in their performance, but I think they're both. If they bounce back and have good starts to their season, it could mean good seasons, and we can jump back up into, oh, franchise quarterback conversation. Sean, I want to jump back to Daniel Jones. I thought you made a great point. I'm looking at somebody tweeted out uh, a screenshot, side-by-side, two screenshots of the New York Post. day after the draft, it shows Dave Gettleman on the front page. His eyes are closed, and he's throwing his hands up like, I don't know, you know, one of those caught-out-of-context pictures. It says, Blues clueless. Inexplicably, Giants take Duke quarterback number six. Today's New York Post sports section. Uh, it shows a picture of Daniel Jones in a hero pose getting ready to throw football, and the title is Air Apparent, A-I-R. Jones makes it clear he's set to unseat Eli sooner rather than later. He's 25-30 of 30 for 369 yards and two touchdowns in the preseason. I know you said don't get excited about preseason, but it just kind of goes to show you how uh, how the public and, and journalists and, and a lot of those guys, and including a lot of GMs, just don't know what the hell they're talking about. Maybe he's still going to suck, but you're a guy who trains quarterbacks. It seems like it's incredibly hard to 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 tell what the talent level is and the transference to the NFL is from a Duke quarterback who played on a team that sucked, but somehow you had him number two. Yeah, and here's here's why. When you go back and watch him play, and he, Duke's not going to win a lot of games. right? And then I look deeper into, is he accurate? Is he well coached? No quarterback that came out in this draft is more well coached or more well prepared than Jones because of David, David Cutcliffe. Cutcliffe. Yep, there's no question. So yeah, I, I look deep into that stuff, and it's like hey, Daniel Jones got ripped. What, what's he supposed to do? He puts up his game. The Giants fell in love with him. I always tell everybody, it only takes one to love you. And you know the people that were doubting the people that I guarantee you didn't see ten throws at Daniel Jones in college. Right. They just read a paper, read something, and they find out, Oh, this guy doesn't like him. Well, some guy on a national show. Stephen A. Smith, and I love Stephen A., but doesn't like him. Oh, then guess what? He must be a bust. No, you got to dig deeper, man. you got to do, do your due diligence and watch. And before we bury him, let, 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 let's slow down and let's let the guy play. Now, you should be excited about what you see from Daniel Jones. I just caution people to say, we're not putting him in the Hall of Fame in the preseason. Is he the heir apparent? Yeah. That's why you drafted him second quarterback taken in the first round. That's why you everybody was real, and now they see preseason. And here's overreaction when he got drafted overreaction because he's having a good preseason. Now, he's seeing base coverage. He's seeing stuff that he's a smart kid. And he's got a chip on his shoulder because of the way people talk. And he took the high road on the way everybody talked, and he focused on his business. When some guys don't, he did. And I love it. I think he's going to be a really good player. That's why I had him picked as the second quarterback because of the way he was coached and knowing that he'd take it. And he seems like the right guy to handle New York, just kind of unassuming, kind of like Eli was. But and you know what? If they're 2-6, and six, you got to play Daniel Jones at some point. I got to get him work, so he is going to play. But you're not going to start him in game one. But it just goes to show you when you hear something on TV or the radio, 
Go watch. When anybody wants to question, I get some guy, you know, that's watched four games in his life, and I respect fans that are trying to tell me that didn't play foot, that never played football. I'm not saying you have to, but you got to probably have a little clue to evaluate the position, telling me when Daniel Jones sucks. They said, really? And yeah, you, you telling me about Daniel Jones is like me telling Warren Buffett about finance. Save it, <laughs> right. okay? I, I think I have a little bit more clue. Not that all of them, there's some smart fans, but you got to watch it, and you got to study it, and you actually have to see the forest through the trees. He played at Duke. Had Daniel Jones played at Oklahoma, he might have thrown for 4,000 yards and won a Heisman Trophy because he's really good. So how you're coached and how you perform, and NFL's different than college. I think the guy's going to be fine, but I'm not putting him in the Hall of Fame the preseason, but you can't help but be impressed with his accuracy and how he's dealing with this, and it's nice to know Gettleman didn't do much right this offseason. It appears he did this right, but you've got to do your due diligence. That's why I don't bury a kid early, and I don't crown him early either. I let them play this thing out. If we crown them early, Derek Carr and Jimmy Garoppolo would be in the Hall of Fame today. Mm-hmm. Sean, wh- how does this play out in a um, locker room now where you know guys are going through the weights, the conditioning, the meetings, the preseason, all the stuff that everybody goes through, but when Antonio Brown's not around all the time or Zeke's holding out and Melvin Gordon's holding out, how does that land when everybody else is going through all this to get ready for a season? What's that perception like of those guys holding out? Those are two different ones, I'll tell you. I mean, the, the, the holdout for money and the holdout for Antonio Brown situation are different. Here's why. I don't ever infuse myself into people's money, and most players don't. When it's contract holdout, you want the guy there, and you think, how can they turn it down? But you're not verbal about it. You, just, you say, well, keep going on. The guys that are here, our, stars, our star running back, Melvin Gordon or, or Zeke, will be here soon. But you don't start making comments about, well, I can't believe he's not taking it. That's none of your damn business, and... I don't get into the money thing. So they're different. Players, you be honest, it's, it's not a big conversation in locker rooms. I've been part of a guy holding out in a locker room, a starter. It, it's business as usual. And when he walks through the door, you give him a big hug, and you welcome him and say, we're better now. That's just the way you do it. And Tony Brown is different. Now, while you might agree that, that you'd like to wear your helmet, but what do we have, 1,500 players or whatever in the NFL? 1,499 or whatever it is, there's only one that's bitching about the helmet. Everybody else has got to abide by it. Yeah, I'm telling you what is coming down the pike. Now, he's a spectacular player. You guys know I'm a lifelong Raider fan, and I want him on the field. But now he's becoming as big a distraction or problem or pain in the ass. It matches his talent. So you start to wonder, where is it, when's it become not worth the migraine headache now? They need him. He's explosive, and he's a great player. But if he drops two balls in game four or doesn't get the ball, what are you going to say? Man, I, if I had my helmet, I wouldn't have dropped those balls. I can already see the excuse coming down the pike. And I don't like guys that give me the old I confess it's somebody else's fault. Now, he'll make a bunch of plays. He could catch 15 touchdowns this year if he's out there. There comes a point in time, had he has spent less time bitching and more time putting a helmet on that he finally, like a, like a new golf swing. You fight through the struggles, and they say, oh, I kind of like it. Now I'm drawing the ball, and you get used to it. Some of the clothing that may not have fit, you lose three pounds, it fits a little better now. Okay, things are cool. Put the helmet on. By now, you'd be used to it. But you spend so much time taking it on and off, and your agent's saying, well, you know, he's, 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 his health's at risk. Yeah, so is everybody else's at play. So I don't have any sympathy for Antonio Brown. We all want to be comfortable in what we want. The rules are set up. You don't get to. He's going to lose his second grievance. He's going to bitch and complain, and he's still going to be behind because mentally he's not out there learning what we've got to get done on a daily basis. He's more worried about the helmet. I'm tired of it. Players eventually get to the point with that where they're like, come on, dude, the diva status. They won't say it out loud because they don't want it because they got a locker with the guy. But don't kid yourself over beers or places we don't discuss. They're sitting there saying, this is an absolute joke. Everybody else abides by it. Why is this guy above the rest of the league? I want him in there. I need him in there as a Raider fan. But I get to the point, if I'm a coach, it's like, oh, well, dude, what what do you want me to do? I ain't changing the NFL rules. So you either abide by it and pick up a paycheck. I'd start fining him if he missed practice because he's under contract. You can fine him daily. He would be getting fined out his rear end for over a helmet, do what everybody else does. Abide by the rules and get your ass to camp. Yeah, well said. Sean, we always appreciate your insight. Have a great weekend, and we're going to talk to you again next week. Can't wait. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you. See you, buddy. The Drive.